Good day, everyone. Um, for those who are not seated yet and do, in, and do intend to attend the session, please be seated. We'd like to start. We're already, already a couple of minutes over time. We have a busy schedule. Uh, my name is uh, Bastian Goslings. Uh, I work for the RIPE NCC. And uh, I have the honor to uh, co be coordinating uh, co uh, and coordinating uh, a session called Increasing Routing Security Globally Through Cooperation. Um, I think we are all very much aware, you know, we're a couple of days into the IGF and it's been mentioned multiple times um, what the impact of the internet is and the essential role it plays in many of our, our societies. So whether it comes to work, leisure, education, doing business, even public services, you know, more and more everything is being delivered online and we're so accustomed, you know, to using apps and devices to uh, communicate and to consume content. Um, it's a given, like electricity coming out of a a plug or a water coming from a tap, um, the internet just uh, works, which is a great thing. Also seeing, you know, what happened during the COVID uh, crisis and uh, a lot of traffic, you know, more being drained away because people were working from home and learning from home. Be but because of all of this, the dependency uh, of underlying uh, functionalities that support um, our uses of uh, online services and apps um, we, we, we need to take a closer look, and in this case, we're going to do so at the, at the, at the routing uh, that underpins uh, the internet. This is actually one of the building blocks that everything else uh, depends on, the actual exchange of uh, internet uh, uh, traffic. So what we do is uh, get some uh, experts from different stakeholders uh, uh, on a panel and you know, see what their different perspectives are, either regional or from a, a, a stakeholder uh, uh, view, and um, see you know, what answers we can provide potentially and hopefully also have a discussion with people in the room and people online. So I have the honor to present uh, uh, firstly Verena Weber, policy analyst for the, the OECD. And then here to my left, uh, Katsuyasu Toyama. He works for the Japanese Internet Exchange Point, JPNAP, uh, and is also chair for the uh, Asian Pacific Internet uh, Exchange Point Association, APIX. Then uh, on my right, I have Annemieke Tours, and she works for the uh, Dutch Forum for Standardization. And they're doing some interesting stuff with regard to certain uh, routing security uh, uh, tools, and she's more than happy to share that uh, more with you. Um, I will be uh, providing a perspective from uh, the, the RIPE NCC, what we do, um, both technically and in terms of uh, engagement and community and, you know, and spreading the message. But I especially also want to thank people who were involved in uh, preparing this, uh, Lauren Green from the OECD and Benjamin Bruersma from the Dutch Internet Standards Platform. Uh, this is a sequence of, uh, of the speakers, and we aim to have uh, at least a half an hour of uh, interactive dialogue uh, with, the, uh, with the audience. So we look very much forward to hear what you think on this. Um, but let me start off. Uh, routing security, RPKI specifically as a tool, which I'll go into a bit more detail later, and the role that uh, the RIPE NCC provides as a regional internet registry. So what actually could you consider to be the internet? Well, in this case, we'll use a definition that the internet is actually a collection of individually managed networks. In technical terms, those are called autonomous systems. There are more than 70,000 of those in the routing system. And for people to actually experience one internet, um, these, these, these networks need to seamlessly, or at least you know, not visibly for others outside of this ecosystem, they need to interconnect with each other in order to uh, create an end-to-end -end uh, end -end connectivity from every single endpoint to end every single other endpoint. And in order to do so, these networks need to speak to each other. They need, to, they need a common language. And that's what we refer to in, in internet terms as standards and uh, underlying protocols. Um, there's no central coordination. It's actually an organic uh, thing, the way that uh, networks interconnect. It's mostly based on commercial uh, business relationships and, and need for re reachability. Um, but there's no like central management or uh, uh, authority you know, that runs uh, all of this. So the protocol, the language that these networks speak, is called the Border Gateway uh, Protocol. Um, this is actually quite a, an old protocol. Uh, it's from the 90s in, in, in the previous uh, uh, century. And in theory, using this protocol as a network, you're the one that, that sounds maybe very obvious, but you're the one that should be uh, um, announcing your uh, network identifier and the IP addresses behind that, right? Like, that's what the end users and, and the end devices uh, uh, use. You're the one that should be announcing your network 
But with this protocol, it's actually technically possible for anyone to announce anything. Um, this protocol actually assumes that everyone is telling the truth. There is no real hard built-in security in this protocol. So again, any uh, autonomous system, any network can announce any, any prefix subset of IP addresses. And even, you know, like all these 70,000 networks are not directly interconnected to all of each other. So most of the time, traffic, you know, goes through a, a series of networks before it reaches its destination. And this sequence of networks is called an AS path. And that's not even, that's also like a given if you've received such an announcement, you will, in essence, accept it. There's no way to actually verify whether it's correct or not. Whether, when this information is not correct, and people just share this amongst each other, it will propagate through the entire internet. Again, as I mentioned, this is an old, old protocol. And implicitly, it actually assumes that everyone you know, that uses it and interconnects with each other is trustworthy. And when this was developed, people knew each other. So it's just like this peer review and you know, this, what we call in Dutch, social control. That was part of it. The main goal was just to make it work. No overhead, and there were no like, ex ante security concerns here because there was no need to. And again, no single authoritative source, no central control. Which makes this susceptible to, uh, to incidents. If you think of abusive uh, uh, behavior, an attacker can use this, right, to impersonate itself as another network, to intercept traffic from others, to prevent another network you know, from being reachable at all, to basically disappearing from the internet. And if you are able to redirect traffic, you can use it for other purposes, maybe stealing credentials, stealing cryptocurrency, uh, sending spam. But that's when malicious purposes, um, there's a real intent to do something bad. But actually, most of the time, it's accidents. You know, people configuring routing sessions, uh, configuring their routers, and just making typos, and this wrong information then being propagated on the internet. So in order to make this routing more secure, and it, again, that might sound quite obvious as well, yeah, now you need to be able to verify the routing information you receive from another network. It has, has IP addresses, an announced prefix that you receive, has it actually been originated by the network that is entitled to do so? Has this sequence of networks, right, that actually point to the originating network, is that, is that correct? Has that been tampered with? You want to prevent um, the propagation of incorrect routing information. So where does the RIPE NCC in this case come in? We are a regional internet registry, a term I already used. There are five of those globally. And we cover uh, the region, uh, Europe, Middle East, and central parts of uh, Asia. And that is where we, for our members, which are mostly like uh, networks, organizations running networks, traditionally ISPs, that need IP addresses and AS numbers uh, to run their networks, they come to us in order to receive those resources. And these are the resources that are needed to actually route internet traffic. So what we do, we distribute those resources, we register them, um, in a public database, everybody can, 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 check, can check who uh, uh, is responsible for what. Um, so we can guarantee the unique uh, holdership. Maybe imagine IP address you know, can only be distributed once. It can only be used by one for one endpoint and not multiple times. And combined with that, uh, we can uh, distribute certificates to our members who can then cryptographically sign their IP addresses uh, and the relationship with their uh, autonomous system number, so their network identifier, uh, in order then to take the next step for others to check who is entitled to use which IP addresses and what uh, 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 network number. And that's where the term resource key public infrastructure structure steps in as a tool, RPKI, so to speak. So how does uh, RPKI improve routing security? Well, as I mentioned, um, it makes a, a cryptographically with a certificate and a, a, hard, a, a, a statement with regard to uh, an, uh, an AS number, a network identifier, and uh, the IP addresses that are associated with it. And these cryptographic statements can then used by, uh, can be used by other networks who can download them and use specific uh, software tools for that, uh, route, uh, val uh, routing validators they're called, to actually verify whether statements they receive uh, when you connect the, your end router to the rest, to, to other networks, and receive routing uh, uh, announcements from them, route announcements from them, to actually verify whether those are correct or not. And um, that, you know, refers then to the originator of um, an announcement that does not really say anything about the path, the sequence, and, you know, the, the other networks that are mentioned in there. 
But that's actually something that RPKI can also play a role in uh, in the future. And that's then called path validation. Um, so the five RERs, uh, we're one of them for our region, and then globally there, there are five of them. They act as trust anchors here. Um, and then the, the whole signing of resources happens in a, a hierarchical fashion. Um, so the RERs, they distribute certificates to their uh, resource holders, to their members, and they, they can then use the, uh, those certificates to sign their resources and create statements, and those statements are called uh, route origin uh, author authorization uh, statements, ROAS. I just want to comment on, um, to make it more sp specifically, you know, what, what, what RP RPKI can contribute here. There, there was already, there still is, uh, an older system in place called the Internet Routing Registry. It's from the 1990s. Uh, RPKI was uh, developed shortly after 2010. I think, you know, the RFC was published in 2012. And the IRR system is basically databases as distributed. I think there are 12 of them um, where networks, you know, can register um, their routing objects, you know, and their routing policies. So their AS numbers uh, associated with uh, the prefixes, the IP addresses that, the, that they're responsible for. The thing there is, if you use those databases, you need to maintain them, which can be automated to some extent, but it is a responsibility. You have to actually see to it that the information in there is accurate. And here too, the thing is, okay, the information is there and it's very useful uh, if, it's, if it's accurate, but there's no hard way of actually verifying that it's correct what is in there. And that's where RPKI in, steps in. It's not only um, because the RERs are responsible for this, uh, this system, they actually have control, eh? they distribute these resources, they have insight into who uh, can use uh, uh, what, so they have control over the accuracy of the, of the data, so which network can use which uh, IP addresses. And because crypto crypt cryptography is involved, uh, it, 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 invol uh, it brings a hard form of trust. So as a, as a, as a mechanism, it's quite powerful. Um, it can prevent hijacks and, and route leaks. And I mentioned the stepping stone towards path validation. But the thing is, it's, it's opt-in. On the one hand, it's good, right? Um, you're not going to enforce this, to, for pe at least not where we're at now, for people to use this. But there needs to be there need to be incentives for people actually, you know, to start doing this. So in terms of adoption, on our own side, you know, um, you see it, it, it differs quite can differ quite substantially per region and per, per country. Um, on average, on an, uh, on an aggregate level, um, say blip close to 45% of uh, uh, allocated IP address space, IPv4 in this case, uh, is uh, covered by uh, these uh, statements. So on the one hand, that's good, and we see a growing line, but it's not going fast enough. So what are the potential factors limiting adoption of routing security, and in this case, specifically, the, the adoption of RPKI? Uh, and I think you know my colleagues here in the panel will go into more detail with, with regard to their experience in this. But you hear that implementing it is technically supposedly not trivial, especially if you have a quite complex uh, network and customers and suppliers you're dealing with. The thing is that while many, many incidents happen, um, they don't really seem to have a visible uh, impact. Yeah. So an impact you know, that scares people and that gives them a reason to act upon. And there's a, collection, uh, a collective uh, action problem, so to speak. So um, if, you, if you implement this, you, you, you basically help the rest. Um, but there's no immediate, at least that's what people perceive it, not, uh, that's not there. There's no immediate benefit for you. So you make your cost, you make the effort, and what does it then bring you? Yeah, it, it makes it for others easier. But while on the other hand, you think if, if, if all your services are provided online and it's about continuity of service and also reputation, right? Damage that, the, that you could do to your reputation if things go bad, that there definitely is a reason to get your act together. And um, I think, you know, the OECD will also maybe go into that in a bit more detail, that there seems to be, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to get really robust data on this and insightful data and also, you know, that others and policy makers can, can use. So briefly, uh, before I end, uh, so what's the IREP NCC doing here? Well, it, it, it's hard in our strategy, strategic goals, to operate a resilient, externally auditable and secure resource certification trust anchor and combined with that to promote the use, in this case, of RPKI. Um, we take our role, you know, of Trust Anchor very, very seriously. And, um, yeah, to promote the use, 
not only are we here at the IGF, right, to, uh, to, to, to talk about this, but we do a lot of training. Um, we provide free online courses, so anyone can go to academy.ripe.net and uh, create an account and take the courses for free online. For those that prefer to have a physical trainer, uh, and we do that, uh, initially we did that especially for our members, we travel around the service region to, to give in-house uh, trainings to people, also with regard to routing security and best practices. And uh, we host webinars, so then to, to, to make it le less of an impediment for people that travel, you can do it online. And we do so also on request, so like if there's a need to, for instance, you know, we did uh, such a thing with the Dutch uh, government, we can organize uh, tailor-made uh, trainings. And then obviously the outreach and a community building part, we host many uh, uh, meetings where we talk about this and update the community with regard, you know, to what we're doing and wh where we're at. We host ROA signing parties, so just get people in one room, right, like because it might seem um, yeah, uh, quite a large tr threshold for people to actually do this, but if you then take them by the hand and show them how easy it can be done via the portal and uh, you can do it on the fly and before you know it, you know, you have your ROAS and everything is in green. So that really, that's quite successful. Technically speaking, um, we are pre pre preparing ourselves uh, for the introduction of ASPA, Autonomous System Provider Authorization. And that's meant, you know, to uh, take a step further when it comes to uh, path validation. And once the standard has been finalized and published, uh, we will be ready to f support this. And um, with regard to the infrastructure itself, the hardening of it, the security, uh, we're working on auditing it and uh, having it formally uh, certified. Also in terms of, you know, we're not regulated, but we, we actually we tr we try to act as if we are uh, for the benefit uh, of us all. A uh, slide I put in there in terms of internet message, message services, just a, a shameful plug here. Um, there's a lot of data, you know, that we collect, uh, probes that we have installed all over the place, you know, that uh, give, and, and via RipeStat, you know, give people a nice interface to get more insight, and also in terms of routing. There's a routing um, information uh, service where we have like three, 23 globally uh, distributed uh, collectors at internet exchange points right, that, that collect the uh, routing data uh, and um, give people insights, you know, and, and, and the data has been collected since 1999, so there's a lot of stuff, especially, you know, for researchers and academics uh, that might be useful uh, there. So that was my introduction, a bit longer than I hoped for, but I hope this made sense. I tried to make it not too technical, and then um, I would like to hand over to Verena from the OECD. Thank you, Bastian, and we're just trying to sort out the technical issues. So, Bastian, could you log in on Zoom to share the presentation, so it seems, so that our remote participants can see the slides as well. Uh, meanwhile, um, I'll start. So, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Verena Weber. Uh, I'm working for the OECD, where I'm heading the Communication Infrastructure and Services Policy Unit. Um, so, for those of you who don't know the OECD, um, so, uh, we are an international organization that is composed of currently 38 member countries. We have a further six countries that are currently in the accession process, and our membership spans uh, from the Americas, Asia, and Europe. Um, so, the idea of the OECD is really to write a forum for our member countries to exchange best practices and advice on public policies, and we do, like, as the organization, uh, the entire organization covers a huge range of issues from trade to education uh, and digital policies, which is uh, where uh, my team sits. Um, so, and, like, uh, we have one working party uh, that is dealing with telecommunication issues, uh, which has the same name, so working party on communication infrastructure and services policies. So basically, we have a program of work and budget where our member countries tell us those are the key issues we would like to work on with you guys in the next two years. Uh, and you'll see that security was uh, one of those um, priorities. Uh, we do the broadband statistics for the OECD. So if you go to the OECD broadband portal, you'll find all our statistics uh, on broadband for our member countries. And um, as I mentioned, like we had quite an important work stream with our sister working party uh, on security in a digital economy where we looked at how we can secure communication networks. So this was a series of three reports. We had one more general report uh, looking at the main trends, uh, how communication networks are will involve and what does that mean in terms of security implications. We had one more specific report on the DNS 
And we had a third one, which is the one that I want to present today, uh, which is on routing security. And I would like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Lauren Crean, uh, who you can see now on the screen. Uh, hi, Lauren. So she was instrumental to the report. Um, so let's dive right in. So you could think, OK, you know, it's quite strange that actually the OECD is looking into routing security. So, so why is that? And so our members wanted to know more about the issues that uh, Bastian already presented around routing security. Um, so basically, you know, uh, what's the problem? What are the scope and scales of routing incidents that we're facing today? So that was one important point uh, that we tried to address. Um, then obviously, you know, uh, if we all agree, okay, there are in incidents when it comes to, to routing security. The next question is, okay, how can we mitigate that? Um, so uh, what security techniques have been proposed, are available. Um, Bastian mentioned some of those, um, and how effective are they? And then, of course, you know, one important point, and this is the one I'll focus on during this presentation, is what is the role of policymakers, right? So what should be their role in this multi-stakeholder community uh, in securing the routing system? And I think, like, uh, one conclusion from Bastian's presentation is that, well, routing vulnerabilities have been understood for many years now, but they persist, right? And he already uh, went into the fact why that's the case. Bastian, could we move to the next slide, please? We're still figuring out um, tag issues. Perfect. Um, so, so what are the challenges we see? And uh, you know, there is a great overlap with Bastian, which is good news because otherwise, I think we should start to get word on this panel. Um, so, first of all, I mean, the internet is a network of networks. So that you mentioned, you know, collective action is needed. Um, so the act that means that basically that uh, one actor's actions depend on the actions of the other actor in the system, but this is also, you know, why we're all here to have a multi-stakeholder approach to discuss these issues. Um, the next issue uh, that I think Bastian has mentioned so far is, well, actually that costs money, right? The implementa implementation costs a bit of money, um, but if you are implementing um, routing security techniques, you're not directly benefiting from that, right? And you still have a problem if there are other actors in the ecosystem that don't do so. Um, so, so that's the second issue. And then obviously, you know, um, there are now like a set of different solutions out there to make routing more secure. Um, but I mean, basically companies need quite a layered approach to secure uh, their, their routing efforts. So which can also increase the risk of mistakes and misconfigurations. And so there is not one thing at the moment that actors can do to fix the problem once and for all. So, so this is the background we're facing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we looked a bit at, uh, you know, what countries are doing in the OECD, and what we do see is that our countries are becoming more interested in routing security. I mean, this is not surprising given, you know, that more of our lives uh, are digitally being transformed. I mean, our, all of our economies are going digital, so um, the internet is increasingly seen as a critical infrastructure that we need to protect. So on the slide, you see just a couple of examples. Um, so, for example, um, the FCC launched an inquiry in February of 2022 about internet routing vulnerabilities and followed up on this uh, notice of inquiry together with CISA. Uh, they hold a workshop in uh, August of this year, uh, published a blog post uh, outlining recent actions, and one of them includes um, basically the federal government's BGP security practices um, basically meaning uh, cleaning up a bit their routing techniques, uh, including RPKI. Um, then we have um, Sweden. So Sweden and the regulator of Sweden, PTS, um, they undertook uh, quite an extensive monitoring um, of uh, BGP uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so they, they looked at, you know, how well are their companies doing? Um, and basically what they found in this exercise, which took them a few years, is that like broadly speaking, it's fine, but they had some recommendations for certain actors uh, to improve. And the third uh, action I would like to mention is the one by ENISA, uh, which is the European network uh, 
an information security agency uh, which published a report on seven steps to shore up the border gateway protocol. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so now, you know, if we take a step back and say, okay, you know, what should and could uh, our governments do? Um, so we identified four key pillars in the report. And one important point I would like to make here that this is really not about measures that one place undue regulatory burden uh, on operators. So this is certainly not what we intend to do. Uh, nor to centralize the control of the routing system, right? Um, so our four recommendations uh, for policy actions that we identified is like one, uh, we need to get better in the measurement uh, of routing incidents and the collection of time series data. So just um, during the period where we basically were actively working on the report, we found that some data collection has been discontinued we found that data collection is heavily dependent on really interested individuals in the community, right? This is individuals that have been doing this uh, for their entire lives, for a very long time, that are really passionate about this. Um, but for example, we found uh, one person who changed jobs and then suddenly, you know, we have a problem, right? So, so this is something uh, that's not ideal. Uh, what we also see, and so we are showing different measurement efforts in the report, uh, on routing incidents is that, you know, they vary quite a bit in terms of results. So, um, so basically we had to explain policy make, okay, this is data available, but uh, yes, it might not always be consistent, and yes, there are different measurement approaches. Um, so really, like, one big action for policymakers would be to really fund uh, and ensure, you know, uh, continuous measurement of routing incidents, really, and, you know, to build up a time series uh, that we can work with. Now, the second uh, important area is that obviously governments could lead by example by implementing routing good practices and uh, promoting the deployment of available techniques, uh, especially obviously when it comes to government owned IP addresses and autonomous systems. Um, so, and even, you know, what I mentioned, all these techniques are currently like a bit incomplete, but because none of the techniques fully addresses the issue. Um, I mean, they offer a lot of protection against routing incidents. Now, my third point here is that governments obviously have an important role in information sharing uh, between different stakeholders uh, through, for example, formalized feedback groups. Um, so we could also think about, you know, using um, established systems such as the certs that we have across many OECD members um, to basically, so use them to enhance information sharing. And finally, um, governments could also define a common framework with industry on how to improve routing security. Uh, and, you know, there, there is a big, uh, there, there are a lot of different options on how to do this. So they range from formalized partnerships to regulatory monitoring of implemented techniques uh, to voluntary guidelines. Or uh, finally, you know, and that's like the strongest step uh, to more defined secondary legislation. So on the next slide, I have a couple of examples um, that I would like uh, to share with you. Um, so the United States uh, has been doing great uh, in promoting the measurement and collection of uh, time series data. Um, so this is um, through the NIST's RPKI monitor that tracks the global implementation of RPKI. And then of course, you know, we, we know that the technical community, like including Ryben CC and Abnik, uh, provide, very, provide very useful data. But we can see that, you know, in some cases it makes sense that a government complements uh, and supports that data collection effort. Now, when it comes to leading by example, so we have one very successful case in the Netherlands, and we will hear more from Anne Mieke uh, in a minute, so this is why I won't go into further details. Um, uh, I did mention like the US, uh, we, we have the national cybersecurity strategy that commits the government uh, to implement good routing practices and security in its own IP space, uh, which is basically one of the OECD recommendations we have. Um, Australia is getting more app active, um, so through the Australian Cybersecurity Center, so they have guidelines for gateways that provide information and recommended action to improve security. 
And they also provide information on BGP route security uh, and namely RPKI implementation. Uh, then in our host country, Japan, um, we have the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, the MIC, uh, that sets standards for safety and reliability of information and telecommunication networks uh, that propose further information sharing among operators, especially during security incidents, to one, determine the cause of the incidents, and to two, consider appropriate countermeasures. And finally, when it comes to defining a common framework with industry, uh, we have a couple of countries uh, such as Brazil and the United States uh, that have quite a good uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, with uh, industry and other stakeholders. Um, so the Japanese um, guidelines that I just mentioned are an example of voluntary guidelines. But then we also have more uh, legal frameworks. Um, so for example, Switzerland uh, has broad general guidelines for communication services providers that aim to establish a minimum level of security of communication infrastructure and services. And Finland, uh, zooming into BGP, um, has uh, basically legislation uh, that uh, stipulates to uphold basic security of the BGP. So you can see like they range from like a pure consultation cooperation uh, with different stakeholder groups to legal requirements. So that, that's the range of measures that we're seeing at the moment. And uh, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, so the main takeaways uh, of this presentation, so we all know uh, that routing vulnerabilities are happening. Uh, not all you know, have severe effects, but some can have them. Um, and uh, they can affect the availability, integrity, and confidentiality of communication services, and this is something we don't want to happen. Um, only what gets measured gets improved. So at the OECD, we're quite evidence-based driven. So uh, we really need better data uh, on routing incidents. Uh, we do see several ongoing efforts to improve routing security, uh, but no single technique at the moment uh, meets all of the challenges. And then finally, um, governments have an increased interest in routing security. Um, and so we propose several actions in the report uh, to really improve uh, overall routing security. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Evelyn. A very insightful, uh, and uh, I'm very glad you know that you, from that perspective, could share this with us. Uh, next is uh, Katsuyasu Toyama from JPNEP and APIX. So for more, probably more technical perspective there. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Katsuyasu Toyama. Yeah, I'm from uh, uh, the operation uh, community. So, uh, in a operating the JPNAP Internet Exchange in Japan, and also a chairperson of an uh, APIX Association of Internet Exchanges in Asia Pacific region. So today, uh, from uh, this standpoint, I would like to show you about an uh, Asia or world uh, situation. Okay, please, next. So uh, I well remembered uh, approximately uh, six years ago, so we had a uh, big failure uh, that is caused the big tech Oh, this is in that Google, maybe you remember. Yeah, they leaked the peer traffic to an uh, uh, upstream provider. Please. <laughs> yeah, so they leaked uh, the, uh, the prefixes, and then uh, the traffic uh, is in the rerouted to uh, the worst one. So uh, at the time, the traf uh, connection, co co uh, sorry, the communication when the content and the eyeball is a loss or a delay, so the degree of the oh, quality of the communication. Okay, please. Yeah, so this kind of um, misoperation, but also the hijacking is often frequently. Yes, please. So, but then the, as the Bastian mentioned, the routing security is in a long time very important things. So, network operators uh, have been trying to uh, secure our internet uh, for a long time. So at first, uh, the route filling with an uh, IRR, yeah, that is an, uh, oh, the routing information, which is not authorized or certified. But then uh, we use the data for a long time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that was in, uh, sometimes uh, not up to date, obsolete. Yeah, so sometimes too hasty to use that data. So the 2010s, uh, yeah, so RPKI uh, started. So now we are moving to the RPKI things. So please go next. So how widely uh, the RPKI is deployed? So please stay next. Oh, ROA and ROV already mentioned, so please. 
So this is the data from uh, APNIC Labs, uh, which are published on the web. And uh, the summarized uh, according to the regions, the basically the RIR so region. So the Africa, North America, Asia and Oceania, Latin America, Europe and Middle East. And each region, oh, they have <coughs> uh, some kind of uh, some ratio of uh, deployed in the ROA. So the green part, uh, you can see, that is an uh, oh, range or ratio of the ROA enabled. So as you could see, uh, the Europe and the Middle East, uh, the many space approximately 70% are already covered in the ROA. Uh, but in the whole Africa or uh, area, uh, that is the North America region, there's still the less than 30%. Yeah, so oh, according to the regions, the deployment or penetration of the RKP especially the ROA part, is uh, not different, okay? So please go on to the next slides. Yeah, so this is also the same, uh, the comparing from the route object, okay? So oh, you could see some oh, ROA invalid. I think this is uh, not on the hijacking, but uh, I think the misconfiguration of a uh, misregistration of the ROA, that's a kind of thing. Okay, the still, yeah, Europe is in the very uh, widely covered by the ROA. Okay, okay, go please. Yes. So why the networks have uh, registered or deployed ROA? I think, uh, I believe that uh, some global tier one providers uh, the, and also the big techs are uh, recommended to register ROA. And sometimes they're uh, saying to the eyeball networks, if you do not register ROA, in the future, uh, we will reject your routes. Yeah. So the, like in the Japanese, for example, the Japanese operators, they are of fear to uh, lose the connection. Yeah. And cannot access to the such and the, the famous and the popular services. So they gradually started to uh, deploy and register the ROA. I think that is a reason. Yeah. So if they do not. Uh, registered ROA, yeah, maybe uh, they will lose the customers. Uh, and that means that they lose the money. Okay, so next, please. Okay, so I, uh, as I mentioned, I am uh, oh, conducting that oh, APIX. And there, oh, uh, I asked uh, and that's did a survey about an uh, oh, ROA and RPKI kind of things. Okay, so why ROA? <laughs> is used or not used in your country or economy. And there are, we got us in the, not many, but in a few oh, replies. So in a Bangladesh, uh, as you could see, in a Bangladesh, ROA uh, becomes approximately 90%, okay? So oh, they say they did no big challenge. And networks, oh, they're doing that by themselves. And it becomes a normal. Uh, it's a great thing, I think. In a Singapore case, the government recommended, uh, government uh, re uh, regulatory recommended a few years ago, uh, but that is not regulated, only the recommendation. And that they becomes an uh, approximate 60%, okay? And the Thailand case, oh, they also the 43%, yeah. And the, oh, the obstacles or, yeah, what is in the, oh, yeah, prohibited or not allowing to do the ROA is sometimes they are saying, for, if you look at the Singapore's answer, oh, there uh, some ISPs operators do not have a necessary knowledge or skill set, okay? And also in the Thailand, they are same, saying the same kind of things. So operational level, they should learn more and make the convinced, yeah doing the uh, RPK things. Yeah, oh, I think that the management level of the Thailand, or oh, they are allowed to uh, do that, but the uh, oh, engineers uh, have not oh, much knowledge or skill about that. Okay, so that these are the oh, operators' oh, reactions. Okay, so please go to the next. So then, oh, how about an ROV? So as, I, as far as I know, not so many networks deployed on the ROV. Okay, please. 
Yeah, oh, this is in the feedback from uh, oh, the such kind of the operators in HPAC. And uh, oh, I asked oh, to uh, IXP friends in the Edge Plastic region. And the Bangladesh guys oh, replied, oh, they are not oh, deployed our oh, way in their oh, internet exchange. But oh, he, the person says uh, they are in the deploying phase and maybe uh, oh, deployed by the by end of this year. Then uh, Singapore already, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, all SGIX. And Thailand case, uh, the BKNX, they are deploying the ROV. So oh, yeah, some of the oh, internet exchange doing the ROV on their route servers. Yeah. But then also they are saying that uh, sometimes the knowledge is not so enough to do that. And especially as some kind of an, uh, oh, fear to lose some kind of that, that valid you know, route. So please go to the next. So this is the feedback from uh, Japanese operators. Yeah, so why they do not oh, deploy ROV? Yeah, because in, uh, yeah, sometimes they appear about the, oh, the invalid route or mistakenly judged. Oh, that is uh, very dangerous, yeah. so. That is one of the reasons. And the other reasons are like, and the, oh, yep, still the software engineer needed because then the RPKI softwares are basically the open source and not appliance uh, provided. So, oh, need more software engineers. And also, the not many network engineer itself is not so many. For example, then small ISP or cable TV operators, they do not have enough engineers, only one engineer operator, that is a not a rare case. So in the case, they are very busy, so not too time to learn uh, of an uh, RPKI. Okay, so please go to the next. So what can I, uh, IXP do for this, please? So of course, in the ROV at an internet exchange, this is a JPNF case, uh, we are doing the ROV for a long time. And also the invalid routes are uh, not announced to the peer, so we are discarded that, okay? So this is, uh, uh, of course, and as I mentioned, oh, several internet exchanges in APAC region doing this kind of the ROV. This will reduce the burden of an, uh, our networks, uh, okay? So this is not uh, uh, good things, okay? And, uh, okay, so please go on to the next. And not only that, uh, we are doing the experimental project to facilitate ROV. Yeah, as I mentioned, some networks, some operators says they do not have an, uh, enough oh, software engineers to deploy and uh, oh, like several kind of software. So uh, some of them say that, and, uh, oh, internet exchange people, please oh, operate. Please do the service about an ROA cache servers. The ROV cache servers itself is an open software, and uh, you know, it is and sometimes and very difficult to operate. So, oh, in uh, Japan, uh, we are now trying to challenge to provide an ROV cache servers at the IXPs, and which can be used the IXP oh, users. Okay. Yeah, but then there is some kind of uh, difficulties because the ROV cache oh, should be operated in one is. Yeah, so the communication channel between the routers and the uh, ROA cache oh, not encrypted oh, in, in general. And of course, uh, there are some uh, options to encrypt uh, and on top of it to exchange some kind <coughs> of information. But the still the part, uh, we think that uh, no good oh, standard, not good implementation, oh, it's not uh, we, ha we don't have that. Okay, so that is a uh, concern. Okay, please go next. So oh, as I conclude of my talk, I would like to suggest that uh, oh, s oh, for to deploy the ROA, so some organization in a country should recommend that. that. Now, oh, I like the approach to uh, industry by doing them by, by ourselves. But uh, sometimes uh, the cost issue or the you know, engineers are not so many. So oh, need some justification. And uh, 
higher level or easily or persuaded if there is some kind of a standard or recommendation for the country level, oh, that is easy to do that. So NIR or regulator, government, maybe you can do that kind of a recommendation. That is one of the good things, I think. And of course, the RPKI specification that, that and implementation should be updated. Yeah, as I mentioned, there are some oh, lack part or oh, that less part, so that should be uh, implemented. And of course, oh, the, the global routing security, that is a long and winding road, as you, as you know. So oh, the first case I told about in the Google's the root leak, that should be uh, needed as an uh, ASPAS validation. Yeah, so that is not in the next or next, next step. Yeah, but then we have, uh, uh, we have to do uh, a lot of things, but we should go at for that uh, goal, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think very insightful because it's like practical experiences, right? What operators are doing and what you can see at your internet exchange. So I think, you know, that's very much uh, adds, you know, gives a perspective on uh, what we're talking about here, the evidence-based approach, so to speak. Um, I suggest, you know, any um, questions, comments, you know, let's do them after the, the, the last presentation uh, from Annemiek, who will be speaking on uh, behalf of the Dutch form of standardization. So thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I thought I'd put it on. Thank you very much, <laughs> both of you, all of you. Thank you for the compliments, Verena, <laughs> for the Holland and the background, uh, Katsuyasu. Uh, my name is uh, Annemieke Toersen from, uh, yeah, you call it the Dutch, but yeah, we have to say Netherlands Standardization Forum, but doesn't make sense. So if you put the next screen on, uh, shoot on, then you can uh, follow uh, everything. What is the uh, Netherlands Standardization Forum? It is a think tank for about, uh, with about 25 members and uh, focused on interoperability and advises uh, the Dutch government as a whole. And those members are on personal title involved in this uh, forum, and uh, they, are, they have a background in the government, but also in businesses and uh, science. And uh, the focus, uh, the main focus of the forum is uh, a list with mandatory open standards. This our core business is uh, focused on uh, the mandatory of the open standards we were talking about earlier. And the scope of this uh, list is only for public sector organizations. Of course, uh, uh, private uh, it's, uh, not a <laughs> can also use it. Uh, that would be a nice. Can you next slide, please? Uh, but what are uh, this, uh, why are we using those open standards? Well, as you all might know, because you're joining this uh, this uh, workshop, uh, the open standards are for interoperability, yeah, exchanging data safely and trustworthy, security, in order to be trustworthy to the to the society. It should be accessible for everyone. 25% uh, of our population in the Netherlands are not able to. Uh, watch uh, internet or, or, uh, or they have no access to it, so we should realize that. And of course, vendor neutrality, so we shouldn't be dependent on vendors. Therefore, open standards is very important in your services. Next slide, yes. An adoption w of uh, strategy internet security standards, we have three levels or three points for the items, which I here have uh, a slide of. First of all, we focus on the obligations. I already told you of the mandatory. Uh, we do that with a comply or explain uh, a list. So, uh, well, I'll come to back to that later on. And that is, of course, comply or explain for new investments, uh, ICT investments. Uh, furthermore, we have public commitments with implementation deadlines. So uh, later on, I will show you also what that means especially uh, RPKI is one of those. <laughs> and we have uh, obligations by ma uh, mandatory by law. So lately, July the 1st, we had uh, in the G Dutch government approved a law for HTTPS, for instance, and ASTS, an open security standard. 
Furthermore, we have the second uh, one, is uh, monitoring, and third, cooperating. I will go first uh, deeper in the, in the obligations. I already told you about the comply or explain list, but the list is um, for about 40 standards, and all those open standards, uh, uh, 15 of them are uh, uh, security standards. And what we do on the list is um, we have experts uh, gathered, collected, in order to uh, evaluate uh, those standards. And the criteria are mentioned here. You have to go to the next slide, please. OK. Um, OK, it's, uh, if you go uh, uh, back, uh, back to the former sheet, please. Yeah. Um, if uh, the adoption strategy, uh, number two, uh, the monitoring, uh, I go, uh, yeah, uh, sorry that I mix up, but uh, uh, I had a different uh, uh, slide uh, deck, but that's not a problem. I go from uh, the sheets. Uh, the ma mandatory, yeah, we had uh, by law. The second was co uh, cooperation. So that means uh, we cooperate a lot with public and private uh, companies. Uh, we have contact with vendors. An example is that we have letters uh, uh, written to Microsoft in order to implement uh, Dane. Um, not only we, uh, yeah, due to our fact we wrote letters, uh, other countries followed, like European countries. And therefore, in the coming spring, they um, announced that they will implement Dane, uh, uh, well, next year, 2024. And we exchange a lot of knowledge. And uh, that's nice because, uh, yeah, then we uh, promote adoption in that way. Uh, monitoring, uh, the, the last one, uh, is uh, that we use the tooling um, of internet.nl. Uh, we monitor, uh, apart from that, we review tenders. So if we procure ICT service in the government, you should ask for uh, open standards. Um, if you don't do that, then you have a uh, uh, reason to explain in your annual report in order to, uh, yeah, to explain, for instance, it's too much expenses. Could be a severe reason. Uh, if not, then uh, you have to use them. The measurements will be published twice a year and offered to the cabinet. So. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, oh, yes. Um, it, it, you need, uh, if you have only one company or one organization using open uh, standards, then uh, it doesn't work effectively. You better have, uh, you can only have advantage of it if there are more organizations using open standards. Therefore, we uh, uh, call it a critical mass uh, needed. And uh, another thing is that end users don't know any and can't verify. Uh, so you need more transparency and awareness is needed. So the information asymmetry is necessary. If we can have the next one. This one I, uh, uh, I recognize, sorry for that. <laughs> I apologize, but um, this is okay. Um, I was uh, uh, talking about criteria. The most important is the openness, added value, market support, and uh, proportionality. And uh, f apart from that, open standards do also have different kinds of categories. Uh, for instance, uh, internet and security standards, our PKI is one of them. But we also have document and web, in e-invoicing and administration, accessibility, for instance, the WCAG, uh, WCAG is also uh, a famous one. And when governments invest uh, or buy such, uh, uh, they must choose for the relevant standards on the list. Um, otherwise, they should have a severe reason to explain in the annual report, as I just mentioned. If you go to the next one, please. I already talked about the internet security standards. Here you see a couple of them. It's in totally there are about uh, 15. The most uh, we mostly recognize HTTPS. I already mentioned that there is a mandatory for it. Um, now, well, of course, here we are for a RPKY, but there are other more. Next sheet, uh, please. 
The second, um, we cooperate. Um, we cooperate, uh, let me see, <laughs> because my slides are different. Uh, cooperation including contacts with vendors. Now, I already mentioned that we, uh, for instance, uh, have contacts with large suppliers. Here you have vendors and hosters uh, like Cisco, Microsoft, Open Exchange, and Google. Akamai is also, uh, no, well, you can read yourself here. Uh, but we also do international contacts like uh, uh, last week we were uh, represented in the Monsieur uh, workshops on the modern email security standards with uh, European governments, and we reused the dot inter of the internet dot nl code, um, and other countries take uh, that uh, in, in notice, just like uh, Australia and Brazil and Denmark. So they use internet dot nl for their uh, measurements. That's very nice that uh, we can uh, inspire other countries. So if you are interested, uh, actually, in also uh, using the internet.nl, please uh, uh, ask, uh, or send us a mail, and then we can help you in the future. Next sheet, please. Uh, we also mentioned monitoring, so measuring. Uh, there are two things um, on the procurement. If you, um, once a year, we um, take, go through all the uh, tenders in the, which are done in the, the Netherlands, and we review them. And uh, during the review, we see what, what's happening, and we see how uh, the growth of using internet security standards are, are growing, and other open standards as well. And we offered this uh, uh, report to the cabinet, so um, governments will be spoken of. Uh, yeah, they will call. Uh, well, they will. They are announced. To, to ha they will see how they do well or not well. So therefore, um, the next uh, is that we. The second part is that we measure uh, by internet.nl. We do that twice a year. But that is uh, specific on the internet security standards. Can we go for the next se sheet, please? Okay, here you see internet.nl, how it works. It's actually very easy. <laughs> you put your uh, URL in it or your email and you found out uh, in one sheet what you're doing. We also have a Hall of Fame, so if people uh, have a 100% score, they can have a, a special T-shirt from us, and it's a collector's item actually. But we, what we do is more naming than shaming, and that works out very well, quite well. Um, next sheet, please. Um, yeah, that's so slogan. If you don't ask it, you don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> um, next sheet, please. Okay. If there are any questions in that way, I would. Uh, uh, also uh, mention that um, the reason we have RPKI on our list of open standards is that uh, we were uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was hijacked. Just like uh, the uh, we are one of the examples of uh, unfortunately uh, Katsuyasu mentioned in his uh, story. Um, we are uh, we were hijacked, and that uh, was a big problem because in two th 2014 November, this uh, uh, yeah, journalist found out, and we were in the newspapers in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, later on in 2015, uh, it resulted in uh, parliamentary uh, questions, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, it could be worse actually, but. Uh, due to the uh, um, RPKI in future using, um, we uh, yeah we can prevent uh, this disaster. Uh, it was accidentally <laughs> found out actually because uh, the national uh, the, the Netherlands uh, yeah the NCSC in uh, Holland submitted RPKI to be continued uh, in the comply or explain list. Um, Due to the hijack, they submitted it to us in 2019. Unfortunately, we uh, p uh, could uh, implement it in 2022 in the internet.nl uh, uh, measure tooling. 
So therefore, we now check also all governments using RPKI. And, uh, well, that means that we have a good uh, side of RPKI in future among the governments, and th that will be nice. But, um, yeah, if there are any further, further questions about it, I would love uh, to answer them. <laughs> Thank you very much. And excuse us uh, for the wrong uh, presentation. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much, Annemieke. And uh, yeah, I also feel like somewhat uncomfortable and apologies, you know. Like I think you did really well, despite the, the fact that the latest version of the presentation somehow didn't now end up in the slide pack. But I think the message came across very, very clear. You did really well. Um, so I want to use, you know, the remaining time we have, uh, uh, according to plan, uh, 25 minutes, you know, to open up the floor for anyone who would like to contribute here, has questions, ideas, comments. Let me first check if there's online anyone who would... No? Okay, thank you. In that case, in the room, is there anyone who would like to? The gentleman here, Olaf, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Olaf Kolkman, uh, Internet Society. Um, I would be uh, amiss if I wouldn't be talking about what I'm going to talk about. Um, I strongly align, very strongly align with everything that the panel said. Uh, routing security is a is a top priority if we want to protect uh, the core of the internet infrastructure. The the routing space. I'm big on that screen. Um, the, the the routing um, uh, 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 space needs protecting. And uh, Lauren said it, uh, uh, and you all, I actually all said it. It's a it's a common action problem. Um, and that common action problem comes with a uh, lack of visibility. It's very difficult to see whether uh, a, 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 a participant in the routing system uh, uh, deploys routing security measures and make that visible and thereby create a little bit more value in the market. Um, and when thinking about this, uh, uh, and this has been a, a discussion within the technical community for, for uh, already a couple of years, I think five or six now, um, the, the community came up with a, a set of norms called the mutually assisted, uh, uh, mutually agreed norms on routing security. And basically this is, uh, uh, these are a number of, uh, of, of measures that uh, uh, participants in the routing system uh, agree to take. Uh, they're different, uh, we have different programs, we have programs for ISPs, we have programs for CDNs, for content distribution networks, we have programs for internet exchange points and for vendors, and there are some different requirements there. And with this program, we try to get visibility for, in sort of general terms for people to understand whether uh, 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 people are good players in the, in, in the routing space. We also want to see whether that has impact. So uh, the Manners Observer, uh, we have an uh, observatory called the Manners Observatory uh, in which we track uh, incidents, but also how does the community uh, adopt and adapt to certain technologies. Um, and yes, the incidents uh, come from data sets that may or not be all trustworthy, and by the way, not all incidents are actually uh, caused by malice. Uh, what more do I want to say? Yes. Um, in taking that other step uh, about creating value, the community is now looking at what we call Manners Plus, but it's the working title, whereby we are trying to identify stronger controls than the ones that are now in the Manners program that can actually be audited. And so with an audit, uh, with an audit uh, scheme, you can also imply a certification scheme. And with a certification scheme, you might create a higher value if you are certified, you have probably a higher value in the market. And we hope that uh, by making route the consciousness of routing security more visible, 
we hope that that also creates the value for the participants when they sell their goods and uh, their, their, their connectivity services. Um, so that's what I wanted to add, because I think uh, um, it, the, 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 the managed community, which, which we host as Internet Society, the managed community is actually uh, uh, trying to, to forward uh, the incentives. And I, I know uh, JP Nix is, uh, Genix is, uh, is a member. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Olaf. Uh, interesting. I, I was very much aware of, uh, of manners. Um, so, but you had the opportunity to plug that. I think it's, it's a very, very important uh, uh, initiative and taking it to the next level, right? Manus Plus, I think it, it's good. It's been around for, for quite a while. I, I'd assume, right, and it's a good thing that uh, those entities, organizations, companies that join uh, Manus, right? And um, I think you have like different programs, right? ISPs, Internet Exchange Point, CDNs, you might even have more by now. Those are the ones, and that, again, that's a good thing, that actually want to commit to this, right? And want to live up to the, the spirit of it and also the practicalities of what you then need to comply with. But what about the rest, you know, that is not there? So I do hope that, that the members, are, I don't know if they're members, but like the, 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 the participants um, also go out to take, uh, take out the message, you know, uh, towards their respective communities. And um, I had the slide here, you know, with some of the factors limiting adoption of routing security and whether, especially when it comes to those that operate networks, eh, the technicalities of using these type of tools, as well as potentially, you know, costs involved to Im implement it. Eh? The projects can be quite significant, especially if you have a, have a, have a large uh, 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 countries, you know, spanning network with a lot of equipment, et cetera. So um, I, I do hope, you know, that the uh, MANUS participants also you know, help to spread the gospel and to work with other networks who not yet are on board to convince them, hey, yeah. you know, it's not that complex or it's not that expensive or I can help you do this or that. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, it is a, uh, a community of uh, uh, ambassadors, <laughs> so to speak. We actually have manners, uh, ambassadors that, that try to do that. And, and mind you, that doesn't exclude the things that, that internet.nl does and, for instance, the procurement uh, uh, approach that has been taken. Those are all kinds of additional things that help boost routing security, and that's why we're in the game. I, I fully agree. No, no thanks for that. Um, sorry, is there someone online who wants to? Yeah. Do have to do that first, and then uh, Professor um, Muller. It's m more of a comment uh, from Benjamin Bruce, and a question actually. Um, the domain name registry of the Netherlands SIDN.nl has an incentive program to give discounts if the domain owner uses some open standards, for example, DNSSEC, Dane, etc., to improve adoption. And the question is um, did RIPNCC look into giving discounts to IP space owners? Thank you, uh, Benjamin. I saw that one uh, coming. <laughs> Uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a very fair question, and I think, you know, SIDN, the Dutch CCTLD operator for .nl, yeah, did really great work there, and it had an impact. Um, I think it's quite a low-margin business uh, uh, being a registrar, and most of those organizations do, other, uh, do hosting and other s stuff as well, but there's not a lot of money there to be made. So any discount they can get, you know, and uh, if, if it's relatively, tri relatively trivial to, to implement the NSSEC, then they'll go for it. And um, I think the situation for the RIPC is somewhat different. Uh, SIDN is not uh, a member-based organization like us, um, so they can, the management can more easily decide, you know, let's, let's do this, combined with the fact that um, .nl actually receives uh, part of the fee that registrants pay registrars. So per .nl domain name, part of it goes to SIDN, so they, know they have like, room to give a discount. Mm -hmm. For the RIPE NCC, we're a member-based organization, and we don't charge based on the resources that um, our members receive or use or whatever they do with them. Um, everyone pays a straight membership fee, so whether you're a small host or a very big uh, international, one of the big tech uh, companies, everyone pays the same. Um, but this might be an, an idea, and I'm thinking out loud now, that uh, that would have to be decided by the members themselves, right? They set the membership fee whether that would be an interesting uh, thing to consider in order to help this uh, move this uh, forward. But it's not up to the RIPE NCC, in, in this case itself, to do, uh, decide upon that. But it's a fair question, so thanks for that, uh, Benjamin. Thank you very much. I can also uh, thank RIPE for, uh, uh, yeah, that's the government, <laughs> Dutch uh, government institutions, because RIPE sponsored courses for 
our PKI in order to adopt uh, this open standard. So therefore, you can sponsor also, in a way, not uh, uh, give a discount, but also sponsor by giving courses about our PKI. That might be a suggestion for other uh, environments and other uh, countries, other governments. Uh, thank you. I'm very happy to take that on board and maybe even more happy to say that that's actually what we're already doing. I, I mentioned it briefly, you know, um, we, d we do give these uh, a, a course. I don't think it's scalable to give um, th them away for free, like the face-to-face -face ones, right? Like you have an actual trainer that travels to go somewhere and spends a, a number of days with people and has a backup, etc. Like we're a non-profit organization, so this is not a money maker for us anyway. And it's more about, uh, it's important to spread the message and to, and to help these people um, uh, to, to learn of these technologies and to actually use them. Um, we have also for BGP security and RPKI free online trainings. Um, so they're available to anyone. So if, if, if you, for whatever reason, I, don't, I can understand that, right? Like in terms of budget, it's a challenge to actually come to travel or to, to, to go to an actual training. Um, then the, the online uh, courses are free of charge available. So that I think at least as a first step would be good, you know, for people uh, to be aware of. So if, if, if you guys are not uh, aware of then I think we ne need to do a bit more of marketing in terms of, you know, spreading, spreading the message that this is, uh, is, is available. And on the other hand, and that's, I think it's a good example what we did with uh, uh, the Dutch public officials, right? People from the Dutch government and, and agencies, etc that we are more than happy uh, uh, to, to have like a dialogue and to see like what in a t tailor-made form we can provide in terms of training and then maybe also including a discount, no problem there, <laughs> depending also on the amount of people and, like, and the impact that we potentially can have. Um, so, and, and anyone, you know, that, that thinks that has, 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 has questions about that, you know, feel free to, to contact me, to come to me and, and to see, you know, what we can do here. So, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Then. So um, we've been studying the, the web PKI, and one of the big um, actions that facilitated the expansion of PKI uh, with web servers is the automation and the creation of uh, Let's Encrypt, which uh, offered free certificates based on uh, this ACME, which later became the ACME standard of automating, is, is it possible for some kind of automation to happen uh, in the RPKI space, or is it so different uh, that uh, you can't use that model? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of the technicalities of the example, like, or the analogy that you make with regard to uh, web, uh, P P PKI. Um, from what I have seen, uh, like this is something you know we're not going to automate in terms of uh, we are not going to create uh, a ROAS, you know, to, to sign statements for uh, the resource holders. Uh, that's something they need to do themselves. But like seeing the way that this actually uh, works within the portal, it's so well, trivial. Is maybe too big of a word. You need to know what you're doing. But for the people you know that manage. So you're it. speaking very fast. Could you slow down and, and speak yeah. a little louder so people yeah. can actually understand what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry for that. Um, the way, you know, that our members create these uh, uh, statements, huh? the RORAs, within the portal, it, it, it is so easy. Uh, like, so that should not be an impediment for them to actually do it. This is not something that we go and automate and do for them uh, automatically. This is, it is something that needs to be triggered by the, uh, the resource holder, uh, him or herself, to actually create, create these uh, statements. I don't know if that answers your question or not, because... Uh, <laughs> That would be my initial response. Well, I guess, it, what is the impediment then? Well, that's, I think, what we're what we discussing here, right? What's the reason for someone not to do it? Either they perceive it to be too technically complex or uh, maybe on the validation part, using the tools, it's too expensive, you know, to configure their routers or other equipment they need to get for this accordingly. So Those that's, are what like they, that's what they automated in the web AI. They thought it was too complicated to manage certificates, so they created the ACME protocol. I, I, I just don't know whether the model is applicable at all. But well, I you need to make the choice, and then, of, then the to tools, of course, need to support the choice that you make in such a way. And, and that part is the tools are sufficiently mature, and the way that we do it via the portal, uh, but also the, the validating software, etc. I don't, I don't think, and I'm not a network engineer, but imagine, and also talking to network engineers, that should not be the challenge in itself, right? If you can run a network, you can do this. It's, it's, in itself, that's not a technical challenge. But they need to make the choice themselves and do it, or have, probably that's more of a challenge, management, approve them to uh, implement this. 
I have some comments and questions uh, from Zoom. Uh, first, um, comment from Benjamin Brusma. For information, manners, the mutually agreed norms for routing security is currently in procedure to be decided to be put on the Dutch comply or explain list. And then I have quite a few questions, so uh, I'll ask them one by one. Please keep me on the list. Uh, first question from Bart Knubben. Could we get to a point that RPKI is the default? For example, that networks do not accept routes that are not covered by RPKI ROAS. Shall I read everything? Um, what do you think? Uh, I, I don't know if, if I may ask uh, my neighbor here, because he, I, th I think, thought that was an interesting example. You referred to tier one operators you know, and, and others. I think large content providers demanding from customers, you know, that they have their resources signed. So maybe you can answer to that question. Yeah. So, oh, the, from the operator side, oh, there's some kind of an, uh, enforcement is a uh, good way, but uh, yeah, usually, uh, so such kind of uh, some kind of penalty is now uh, driving that uh, deployment of the RPKI. But uh, still, the people or uh, operators are anxious about the uh, oh, effect. So at this point of time, the ROA and ROV is only for uh, certificate and validator origin. So yeah, ACE path uh, validation is the two or more steps forward. So not in the perfect uh, solution. So. A kind of an enforcement is necessary, but then the still that is on the way. So, oh, some operators are skeptical to pay the money on the uh, routing securities. Yeah, still, yeah. So that is, I think, the problem. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Lauren Crean, um, addressed to Forum Standardizati. Could you provide further details regarding the tracking of governments you mentioned on internet.nl? Would this be tracking raw creation uh, and or ROF? Thanks. Hello, yeah. The last part I couldn't understand uh, from you. Sorry, can you repeat that for me? Mm, you were mentioning tracking of governments yes, uh, correct. on internet.nl. Would you track ROAS? Uh, uh, ROAS? What is it? Um, we were oh. talking about it. The, <laughs> no, we don't, do, I, don't check so, ROAS. Sorry. Sorry. So, 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 so. Sorry, uh, can I uh, interrupt? Yes, uh, This Benjamin. is pretty technical about uh, the uh, ROA or the ro, uh, ROV in these. Uh, on the internet.nl, we only check the uh, ROA, so the, the certificate at the moment. Uh, to actually check the ROV is uh, more complicated. It could be done, uh, but we would need separate ISP space to uh, that actually has an invalid route to do the check. Currently, uh, we don't do that, and we use the uh, EPNIC data uh, to uh, report this uh, data back to the government in our uh, yearly uh, uh, reporting. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question from Bark Knubben. Um, on its EU Internet Standards Deployment Monitoring website, the EU is also monitoring the adoption rate of modern Internet standards like RPKI and MANRS. Um, what could or should the EU do more? What could or should we do more about uh, measuring or monitoring? Yeah, the monitoring the adoption rate of modern Internet standards. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, um, yeah, what we do more is uh, connect governments in order to do so, uh, and we inform them, we give workshops, but um, the most, yeah, I'm not sure what he wants to know, but we can't, we cannot, uh, we just measure, we offer it to, yeah, we inform, uh, I don't know exactly what he really wants to know, because, yeah, sorry, I can't answer the question. All right. Okay, um, can you repeat it again? Because I didn't. Yeah, sure. So the EU is monitoring. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> there is a paper EU Internet Standards Deployment Monitoring website. Yeah. Where the EU is monitoring the adoption rates of modern Internet standards like RPK and Manners. Yes. The question mm -hmm. is, 
what could or should the EU do more? EU, so this is a question for uh, Verena, I guess. <laughs> or not. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> This is working. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to, to speak on behalf of the EU and I would get in trouble for doing that. Uh, so, so basically, I mean, I, I think you mentioned one point, right? Like information sharing is good. I mean, I think if you could present what you guys are doing, uh, you know, and have this more widely adopted, I mean, that is probably like uh, another issue, but I don't know the site well enough to basically say, you know, okay, how well is it working? How many governments are implementing it? So. From our report, I know that you know some governments are really quite active, but there are quite a few that are not, right? So, so I think you know, like training, raising awareness, and stuff is, is might well, be also an issue on the EU level. But again, you know, like I well, don't want to we, speak for the yeah. EU. We we inspired two other countries. Uh, you already <laughs> mentioned that it was Australia and Brazil, and Denmark. And Denmark also uses uh, the English version of Internet uh, .nl. So therefore, we uh, exchange our knowledge about that and we inspire them. But also, if I, there are any other countries also here uh, 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 available, uh, if they want uh, help for that, we can uh, answer. Uh, we can help you in assisting using uh, the code. The, so the English version of internet.nl is available. So if anyone needs that here, <laughs> we would like to know and help you. Thank you. Um, Rudiger Fogg has his hand up. He also wrote in the chat the question, but uh, maybe I can ask the technical desk if they can unmute him, then he can ask it himself. If that's possible. Somebody can give me a signal. <laughs> Okay, I is it? Okay, I can just read it then. Oh, okay. um, so the question is to Anemike, uh, which RPK standards are you listing in your advice? Are you including advice on standards that still wait for implementation? Um, or, would, or would you need to still fill gaps? Uh, as, as I understand, um, he, he asks whether there are, uh, well, a different kind of RPKIs that I don't understand because um, NCSC is uh, the, the maintainer of the standard RPKI in Holland and they uh, asked us to put it on the list and we go through the four criteria I mentioned and if that is positive then it comes to the list comply or explain and if not, yeah, then it can be to another list, which we call a uh, recommended list. But Olaf likes to have uh, an answer for that. This is uh, Olaf Kolkman. Hello, Rudiger. Um, uh, while I'm not uh, involved with the process, I do understand your question. I think your question is which specific RFCs were input to this process. Um, I'm not quite sure if you noticed, uh, Annemieke, but I'm sure that uh, uh, Bart or somebody else uh, in, in the office would be able to answer that. And um, I'd be happy to forward to that to Rudiger, but Bastian knows him too, so. Well. I think Rudiger in the meantime is unmuted. Um, I, I don't okay. see the red microphone. Yeah. Rudiger, can you if, speak? Yeah, if you can hear me. Yes. Um, Yes, well, okay, kind of uh, Annemieke, the, uh, 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 as Olaf was uh, telling, there are quite a number of RFCs that define RPKI-based standards, and uh, so far I only have been hearing about uh, use of establishment of ROAS and the use of origin validation. Uh, I think Bastian was uh, mentioning the upcoming ASPA, which will be another object in the RPKI. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the RPKI design right from the beginning was targeting something that has been defined for quite a number of years uh, as full standards uh, BGP SEC, which is not yet implemented and which actually needs 
uh, significant action and resources for getting uh, uh, implementation and deployment. And people uh, uh, are usually not talking about it, which is a problem. So I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your question or a remark. Uh, most probably my colleague Benjamin could uh, uh, more talking about that, say about Yes, that. so I, uh, I put the uh, or reference documentation in the chat. Uh, the currently our IPCR, uh, uh, which went into a procedure, has like one RFC attached to it, which is uh, uh, 6,480. Uh, but also lists three other RFCs with recommendations um, regarding the uh, BGP SEC. Uh, we don't do that yet because it needs to be put in procedure by somebody. Is that uh, clear for you? Uh, I, back home. May uh, I ask a, qualify, uh, a qualifying question with this? Um, for the procedure, in order to be accepted, um, there is the expectation that there is a reasonable amount of deployment of uh, a, 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 a particular standard or specification, is it not? That's correct, Olof. Uh, uh, you need not only one organization using it, but you have to find out companion uh, fellow uh, organizations yeah. in order to have uh, uh, yeah, a, a severe uh, standard. Yeah, and accept it uh, in practice. Yeah, so I, it should I, be in practice and it should be uh, supported. Yeah, I think that answers Rudiger's question because BGP ah, SEC indirect, is yeah. not very much deployed at the moment. Okay. Uh, That's yeah, uh, well, okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, seems I'm still there. Uh, yes, I'm uh, very much aware that BGP SEC, in fact, is essentially not implemented. And uh, uh, it kind of, uh, I learned over the past few years that uh, public discussion of making use of RPKI and improving routing security uh, tends to uh, essentially stress the stuff that is almost, that is uh, essentially really available. And uh, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, the advocates of that uh, argue in a way that, uh, yes, uh, what's available now is uh, kind of solving all world problems uh, and uh, ignoring uh, to work on getting the improvements that are still necessary. And uh, uh, actually, actually, uh, 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 the one of the really bad problems is that for uh, uh, the future deployment uh, uh, standards, uh, actually, development work. Uh, needs serious resources and serious resources in particular if we want to progress uh, uh, security and that's not happening and uh, kind of the question is how could we actually um, work on getting those resources in available and in place with the proper people thanks yeah, that's a good question uh, from in, in the Netherlands. We uh, uh, organized a workshop in cooperation with RIPE and we sponsored, uh, so we, uh, we opened a course and only uh, policy makers of the D Dutch government could join these uh, courses and that's what we did together. But perhaps you have in addition another uh, uh, possibility. What do you... Uh. Uh. Well, I'm actually, sorry, Rudiger, uh, I think it's interesting points you, you make. And um, just to confirm, I personally definitely did not want to make the point that we can focus, you know, on the tools that are there and that will solve all of our problems. Definitely not. But I think, you know, when it comes to creating the ROAS and doing the validation, on the other hand, we still have quite a long way to go in terms of um, adoption. But you're absolutely making a good point, you know, that there's a lot more that needs to be achieved and that we need to uh, uh, build on. 
So I want to thank everyone here. I'm sorry that's quite abrupt stopping this now, but you know the, the, the next workshop is going to start soon and people need to prepare for that. I, I really want to thank everyone you know, for joining. I hope this was interesting. And again, you know, if, with regard to the topic, if you want to follow up, I, I'm assuming I speak for all the panelists, right? Come to us and um, approach us and uh, see how we can together move this, uh, this forward. Um, I want to thank all of my panelists here. Great, you know, for all you guys being here and uh, contributing, and I'm really happy, you know. And um, again, thank you again. Also the audience for being here, participating also online. Thank you.